Welcome to the Hage Indigenous Knowledge Center's 10th anniversary online video celebration. Normally, we would like to be celebrating with you in person at Six Nations Polytechnic. However, given the times, we have put together this video for you to give you a behind the scenes look at the development of the Indigenous Knowledge Center, how the idea for the Knowledge Center came about, um, what we've been up to the last 10 years, and also current and future directions for the center. We're very grateful to all the community members, the Indigenous Knowledge Guardians, donors, researchers, students, and other visitors that have came and made the center what it is today. We're just very grateful for what they've, how they've helped us to de develop the center to this point. So I hope you enjoy the video and thank you for watching. Nyala. I'm currently the project coordinator at the Deo Hahage Indigenous Knowledge Center. I've been there since 2014. My main duties include working with the digital collection, 
organizing workshops, scheduling tours. We have a lot of school groups that come in and we do presentations for them. Um, we also develop workshops, uh, assist students and researchers finding material in the collection, as well as taking in donations. And we're very grateful to have donations come in from community members and beyond that um, see the value that we do in the pieces that they do donate to the collection, such as artifacts, um, manuscripts, even their own work that they've created that may contribute to the Haudenosaunee um, research community and resources that are at the Indigenous Knowledge Center. We're getting a known presence out there in the archive and library museum world as well because we want people to know that this is who we are, this is where we are. And fortunately, uh, with the Truth and Reconciliation, a lot of the community's archives are reaching out to communities. And I think it was good timing that we do have the Indigenous Knowledge Center, because now there's a place where these materials can be returned to. People in the community and the students and the researchers in the community have a place to come to look at those materials you can discuss them with people from the community who may have the same questions that you do, but some of them may also have some of the answers that you're looking for too. It's just amazing how much information and knowledge is contained in those things. It's important for that information to be written down and stored um, so it can be retained and preserved and passed on and people can come back and look at it. And it is always also important to, once you read that um, material, examine that material to also talk to people, which is something that can also be done at the Indigenous Knowledge Center. So we're not disconnected from the material to the, the here and now. So it's a living, it's a living resource, living materials. So grateful that people are able to come and share and willing to come and share their knowledge. Everyone doesn't have all the knowledge. We all have a bit of it. So I'm all glad that we're all able to share that material with each other. And we're also able to have sessions where people can come and do hands-on workshops and also learn that way as well. So they're not just reading, they're not just listening, but they're actually doing also. I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I'm so glad that it, it did happen. I was able to work at the Indigenous Knowledge Center. Just amazing that all the information and knowledge that is in a story, um, that is in a piece of artwork, and those are the stories that are passed down um, to like people like the Indigenous Knowledge Guardians um, and the, the older, wiser people of the community, whether we know it or not, but we should listen to those stories and those things they have to say because the information is in there that we need to know the information's in there. When I started in my position, I did a little bit of everything, administration duties, reception duties, filing, the best part of it, uh, I got stuck in the basement with Rick, uh, which was really a blessing in disguise. So I go down in the basement and here I am with Rick um, and all these bankers boxes, one for health, wampum, treaties, language, and they were kind of all just piled up with papers and newspaper clippings and pictures. Uh, maps, there is everything in there. And it was my job to organize that all. And that's where we kind of started in the basement at Polytech. Uh, it's become this huge place now that I never could have imagined 10 years ago. In the beginning, 100% of uh, this collection that we have now was the things that Rick has collected over the course of his life. He's helped bring awareness to the real Haudenosaunee history um, of this continent, and I couldn't be happier to call him my friend. There was a gathering at the Six Nations campus in the Grand River Room. Rick was a speaker at this event. Um, it wasn't held by us, it was held by another organization, but they rented the room. During the breaks, they actually came in into the center. So there was this man that came in. We had these pictures on the walls in the wing where we are. Uh, there, that's where all those photographs are, and we have some in the center as well. He walks in and I gave him, was giving him the tour of the center, and then all of a sudden he stops and he's looking across in the corner. And I could tell that he wasn't listening to me anymore. 
So I kind of stopped and waited for him. He had tears. And I thought, oh my gosh, what's wrong? <laughs> I didn't say anything. I waited for him. And there was a picture in the corner. And he said, that's my mom. He said, I've never seen that picture before. She passed away in 1997. And so we went to the corner. The crowd followed us. And he's crying. And he's talking about his mother. And telling these stories about his mother. I was so overwhelmed. And... So the, all these people had to go back to their, to their conference, their meeting. And when the room cleared, I looked at Rick and Tennis and I said, we have to give that picture to him. <laughs> this is his mother. <laughs> at the end of their, their conference on that last day, or on that day, um, we actually took it, took it into the room in front of all those people and we presented him with that photo and that was a day that I'll never forget. My job is really rewarding, like it feels really good to help people, to share information. It feels, it feels really good. I think working here at Dale Hahage for the last 10 years has completely changed who I am and almost grounded me and brought me back to where I've always wanted to be. It's powerful. It strengthened me and made me a better person. By 1992, we really started talking about we really need to also have like a research center and a resource center. And so it started, the concept started to take better shape. And all during this time, we were also working with McMaster and having dialogue with people like Will Coleman um, and uh, Dr. Don Martin, who is now Dr. Don Martin Hill. She was a student then. Um, she was involved with us, and there were a number of others working with us, talking about this, the need for the community to have reestablished control over our knowledge and, and the transmission of that knowledge. So um, the whole idea of the Resource Center, the Ohahagi came from there in my experience. By 2006, um, we were having formal discussions around um, having our own system of accreditation for our programs and having a, a physical resource center in the community. So a lot of people were coming and, and if I can use sort of our way of thinking and knowing about things, we were really coming to one mind of what had to happen. Um, having come from the whole experience of colonization and the interruption of our knowledge systems and transmission of our knowledge systems. We were busily, I would, I always talk about rebuilding that white path of the two row so that we're re-strengthening that relationship of respect and, and trust. And we knew we had a lot of work to do that ourselves and that was our rebuilding path. Primarily we took that responsibility on. By December of 2008, we had come a long way and we had decided that we were going to affirm and acknowledge our own knowledge carriers and hold them up for what they had you know, maintained and what they were doing. And so in December of 2008, we um, acknowledged our first um, uh, Indigenous knowledge guardians and there were five of them. None of them sadly are with us anymore. Um, but Ima Johnson, Lottie Key, Hubert Skye, Francis Froman and Evelyn Bombery were our first guardians that we acknowledged. And we use the term guardians and, and in the language, I'm sorry I can't pronounce it, but the term that refers to it is, it talks about rafters for protection. That's the term that um, we use for, for this designation. We call them our PhDs, either the people who we go to if we need information about our history, our language, whatever. So, and these people had worked with us all those years and advised us and taught with us and encouraged us. And so they were our first group of guardians that we formally acknowledged. It was a community celebration. There were many people who came to, um, to the site that we're at now um, on Fourth Line. We had, and we had a community celebration and we, and we celebrated them and held them up. We were fortunate enough to be able to, to hire Rick Hill on as a full-time coordinator that same year and that things really took off when that happened. Um, Rick put together the strategic plan for the center and did a lot of public speaking as well and he also donated his own personal collection. So if you go to Deo Hahagi you will see Rick's collection there 
and which really was um, which really was just a, a tremendous gift to the center. We did the second installation of Indigenous Knowledge Guardians, and there were seven installed at that time. Um, some of them are still with us at this time. Um, sadly, many of them are gone. Because the knowledge comes from the people and is carried by the people, we have to make sure that we acknowledge more guardians and we bring them forward because these, this is how the knowledge is kept and transmitted. In 2013, there were another installation of guardians. And then in 2015, we had our fourth installation, which um, thankfully we have many of those folks still with us. So there's a number of people who are still with us and working with us today. When we could, they would come to campus at least once a month and they would have a meal together and um, exchange their language and we would tape that information and they would just visit really and talk about things. And, and that's how we gather information and we learn and we also um, sharpen the language capacity of those who are looking for the language. And De Ohahagi to this day is, is um, continues to receive um, gifts from people in the community, which is um, much appreciated and most importantly it's an indication of the trust that the community holds, you know, in De Ohahagi and, and they know that things will be treated with respect and if there's anything that's of sensitive nature, um, we always look to the guardians to tell us who has access to that information. We understand the responsibility and those who are involved in De Ohahagi um, take it very seriously. So, so we continue to do our responsibilities and, um, and hope that the knowledge never disappears and the resources will be accessed by more and more people. I worked in museums most of my adult life. So I got in the habit of collecting things. Every bit of paper, every photograph, every map, every drawing, you know, all the information. Now, I was studying it for my own good, but I thought I could build up a repository. So when I needed something, I'd have that paper there, the research over there, that treaty over there, and I compiled quite a collection. So one day I was uh, coming to visit my father in the Schwiegen, and I drove by a polytechnic, and I didn't know much about it. I don't think I've ever been in the building before. But they had a sign out front to say they're having classes about midwinter ceremonies. And I walked in there, and Tom Deere was teaching, and there was probably about 30 or 40 students. Of course, everybody looked up and wondered, what the heck is he doing here? So I thought, well, I just want to check it out. Because I never thought, first of all, you'd see a day when such a class was being held. I had taught at the University of Buffalo for 20 years. I taught in Native Studies, American Studies, taught history and culture, art, taught about stereotypes. But the majority of my students were non-Natives. So when I saw Polytechnic and I saw this class and I started thinking about where, what do I want to try next? I thought, well, maybe I'll try teaching at Polytechnic. So I applied and got to one of their teaching positions, and I thought, finally, I'm going to be spending my time teaching a, a young Haudenosaunee people. And it was really great. Linda Stotts was the uh, uh, president at the time, and she asked me if I would uh, help put together a plan. I said, yeah, I just did one at Tonawanda, I can do another one. I already had these ideas about what kind of materials we have, what kind of things would young people be looking for, how, what would foster good research. Uh, because what I was trying to do is to say, here it all is, right here. It's like one-stop shopping in terms of research, and history. Because I've traveled all around to major museums and archives in North America. I've collected them, but it you know, took me nearly 50 years to do all of that. So I felt a little bit of, I had a kind of a moral um, uh, requirement. It was my duty to provide this material at an indigenous educational institution. Polytechnic was perfect for that. Plus, I also amassed by then huge digital collections. I'd say close to a million files. Now, that's everything. Every photo of every arrowhead, uh, uh, reports, uh, archaeological reports, uh, maps, historic events, uh, things that I've written, things that other people wrote. So we had digital material, and then we had hard copies of things, and we had a few original pieces. But I felt the material I had could be a bridge for people who are looking for that. So that helped me, too, to not say it's not an archive, you know, like <clears throat> a museum or university archive, but it's a repository in which our cultural knowledge has a place to play itself out. It's not the end-all, doesn't have all of the 
materials, all of the thoughts, all of the philosophies, but there's, there's stuff there that you can start working with. So with the support of the Guardians and McMaster and a Polytechnic, we were able to launch this place. But it needed a name. And again, I was meeting with these uh, the culture and language guardians. And I said, we want to bring the best from the canoe with the best from the ship. The best research and thinking, and we bring them together. And when I made that gesture, two old ladies, one Cuga, one Mohawk, they said at the same time, Deo Hahage, the two paths bringing together. So like the two or wampum, but it's this two, two paths of knowledge, uh, two pathways in which uh, we can follow. But one of the concepts we're trying to do is how do we bridge that for our students who get more firmly grounded in the canoe thinking, but are spending time in the academy, in the ship, we needed something to bridge these two vessels. Now in our old treaty language, they talked about the canoe and the ship are actually tied together. First with a rope, then with the iron chain, and we're going down this river of life together. So once we accepted the name, then I thought, well, I gotta come up with a logo. And then one night, I was just start drawing these two paths that are kind of headed towards uh, the horizon. Mm -hmm. And then I put these two figures, like from a wampum belt, with their arms linked, but they're holding an eagle feather. But instead of a ship and a canoe, I turn the canoe sideways, bridging both paths. These two figures are standing in that canoe. The feather metal means their common destiny, our common destiny. Some people wondered why, why come we didn't keep it the canoe and the ship were separate? And I said, well, look at us. Look at what we're about. Most of our kids go to the ship for their post-secondary education. Many of our people have intermarried. The children of the ship are related to the children of the canoe. So I wanted a symbol that talks about bridging this, because whether we like it or not, we have to combine our energies, combine our intellect, combine our philosophies, if we're going to pres preserve the quality of life, we're going to preserve the earth. We're going to preserve tradition. We need help. So anyway, that's why we selected that. Uh, something rang true with that with our guardians. They, they, uh, they wholeheartedly adopted it right away. And as we organized the, my personal collection, I, I donated all of the, the papers that I had, and the photographs, the maps, uh, the drawings, uh, the photographs that I had taken, I had uh, 10,000 color slides, we, we digitized them all because we have to think about the long term. People need uh, access to that. When I was a young man, if I had had access to some of this collection, it literally could have changed my life, broadened my understanding of things, uh, helped me uh, with the things I was wrestling with. So I'm thinking that same way. If we can bring the stuff right here, right here at home in Six Nations, that maybe then our young people, our language teachers, our art teachers, our people in the community can use this material so they don't have to wait like me 50 years trying to figure out what something means. We were quite busy uh, doing cultural awareness training, especially in the era of reconciliation. A lot of school groups came by there, came to the IKC. Uh, some of them came to help. We get summer students there working. So it's a very active place. The COVID thing kind of slowed us down. And I think it's allowed us to have a deep breath to try to figure out, okay, what do, what do we want to do in the future? How can people access this material if they can't come to the IKC? Well, what else could we be doing? How, how can we better organize the material digitally so that people could access that material? You know, there's some people who say knowledge is power. But knowledge is just one part. It's information. Wisdom is the application of that information in a pragmatic way, in a practical way in your life. That's what our ancestors did. So we've got to get back to that. The ability to think like your ancestors, but to use that knowledge to tackle the situation you're facing today. It's some practical things, uh, the, the ammunition that you need, skills that you need, perspectives you need, so that you don't let life overwhelm you. You don't let colonization consume you, and you don't let the community descent distract you from the fact that our ancestors were really quite smart, quite knowledgeable about what it takes to exist in this world, and they had the skills necessary to do that. So in a little way, I'm hoping the Deo Hahage and the Indigenous Knowledge Center can help bring some of that back to the people at Six Nations.
So obviously, you know, we're, we're filming this during a really challenging year um, and had initially planned to celebrate our 10 year, our 10 year anniversary with a gathering where we would get to hear from our knowledge guardians and our community scholars and our, our research community and our students and our, our learners in a forum where they could really share what it was, how they were working with this knowledge, how it was contributing to their, their scholarly or creative works. And, and now, you know, we're, we're really thinking about other ways that we can, can have this celebration, but also other ways that we can make this knowledge accessible to community members at a time when maybe they won't be able to physically visit a space. So what can the IKC do to make its collection more accessible through different internet platforms or online archival systems? Definitely moving forward, something that we want to do at the center is really enhance our collection and get it as complete as we can. And, you know, that means like continuing to build relationships with the institutes that we already have partnerships with and expanding those partnerships. There are dozens and dozens of institutes that have um, Haudenosaunee collections as part of their holdings. So hopefully, you know, we can do our part to bring some of that collection a lot closer. I think also we are really interested in expanding our, our physical space. There's a library um, that we've been growing and there's a archive collection. There's various artifacts. There's a lot of events that happen and it all happens within a really small space. So I think for many years people have dreamed of the Knowledge Center as having its own, um, its own building really where this work can just sort of continue, continue to grow. So that's definitely something that we look forward to working towards over the next 10 years. Expanding our research agenda is something else that's really important. Um, creating research fellowships and creating scholar in residences and artists in residences and having people kind of be able to come and work with our collection and help us produce, you know, a year of, um, events and, and seminars and conferences and, and just really share and mobilize knowledge within the community I think is really exciting. And when it comes to really um, putting together what those themes are, I think that's where we really want to work closely with our Indigenous knowledge guardians and where everything kind of starts to connect because, you know, you, you want to take guidance from your knowledge guardians and They've, they've been so generous with us, with their, with their time, and with sharing what they know and transmitting in, in their own way what it is that their ancestors and their older, older people have taught to them and shared with them. That kind of trying to understand what it is they feel we really need to make sure that we focus on for our you know, current and future generations is, is really important. And I think kind of as we have those conversations and as we start to hear what their priorities are, it sort of gives us a focus for, well, what collections then do we prioritize? Um, you know, I think that's always part of the work is really, really listening and really understanding then how do we commit our time, our resources to being able to uh, fulfill in a, in a shared way the, the mission of De Ohahage. I think something that I feel like we've always known at SMP and at De Ohahage is that one of our strengths is really our, our community. We are very rich in community. We have a lot of work to do to do many of the things that I'm talking about. And community is absolutely how we are going to get there.